Hello, everybody. Welcome to session one in our new series entitled Obtaining Answers to Prayer. This is going to be a three-week series, and in it, we're looking at three different biblical characters and how we can learn from their prayer lives and apply it to our prayer life with the Lord. This teaching is based on the book by E.M. Bounds entitled Obtaining Answers to Prayer. So E.M. Bounds was an author and a minister in the 1800s. Uh, he was born in 1835 and he passed away in 1913. And a lot of his writings, a lot of his work is on the topic of prayer, almost exclusively. What's interesting about E.M. Bounds is that he started off as an attorney. He was in the business of law. It only lasted four years, though. And then he was called to the office of a minister. He became a Methodist minister. And uh, naturally, because we have so many of his, his writings, you can tell that he loved language arts. He was a writer. He then became an editor for the official uh, Methodist newspaper entitled The Christian Advocate. So he was just uh, very much in tune with prayer life, into words, as, as you'll see as I uh, pull out different quotes from his book, Obtaining Answers to Prayer, you'll see just how much he loves uh, language. He loves literature. Uh, his writing is very poetic. Um, it's, it's, it's concise. It's pretty short, but it's powerful. Uh, I love his work. And so I'm so excited to teach this to you guys, to, to bring the lessons that he has put in this book uh, to life to you as we as we learn from the prayer life of the three biblical characters we'll be looking at. And the first one is Moses. So we're going to get into Moses today. Um, but first, before we get too far into it, let's pray. We're doing a teaching on prayer. So let's start in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for, for being present. If we're, if we're watching this at home, if we're watching this uh, at work, if we're in our car, if, if we are anywhere we're able to connect and watch this video, Lord, uh, the Bible says that you are present, you are everywhere. And as we strive to get closer to you through the discipline of prayer, would you be faithful to your word as you always are and draw close to us when we draw close to you, Lord. Open up our hearts, open up our ears, our minds, our spirits, God, to, to receive the teaching and to apply it to our lives, Lord. Thank you so much in your name. Amen. So prayer. I believe that we pray, or at least we should be a praying people, if in fact we, we have given our lives to Jesus. We are confident that we are praying to the Father of all creation. When we pray, we pray for a reason. And that reason is to get an answer, right? We, we shouldn't be praying for, for no reason at all, just to have, have words come out of our mouths. That's, that's not the reason for prayer. That's not the biblical example that we have for prayer. Prayer is meant to be answered. As we'll get into later in this teaching, it's not always going to be the answer we want, but in God's ultimate sovereignty, it is the answer that is best for his kingdom and is ultimately for our benefit. God is our father. He wants us to follow his plan. And through prayer, we make our requests to him. But we've got to believe who we're praying to not only can hear us and, and is, is capable of hearing, but he's capable of answering. He's capable of doing something about our requests. We need to have that foundation belief that who we're praying to is hearing and is capable of doing something. It's much like a seatbelt, right? If we have a, a seatbelt in our car that is designed to save us, to prevent a great bodily harm and even death in the event of a car accident, but we don't believe that that seatbelt is going to do its job right. We probably won't use it. But if we believe that all the decades of testing, of trying out the 
best way to secure a human being in the event of a car crash is a seat belt. They started off just on the lap and then it went to lap and shoulder. And then now you'll even see some of the more expensive upper class cars that have airbags in them. So they've, they've got inflatable airbags along the seatbelt that that puff up when you get into a car accident to keep you even safer. But if you don't believe in that seatbelt, you don't believe in the technology of it, you're not going to wear the seatbelt. Likewise, we don't believe that God is faithful to hear and to answer. We're not going to be praying. So the very foundation of a prayer life is to believe that the one you're praying to is listening continually and is able to do something about your requests. Prayer is one of the most basic, fundamental elements of our Christian faith. We need it. We cannot have a striving relationship with the Lord without prayer. It's just absolutely necessary. I'm a big fan of Michael Jordan. I was more so in, in, in the 90s when I was growing up as a kid, just watching Michael Jordan play basketball was just something that was so, so great. And he was so creative and so dominant on the court. But I remember watching a documentary on him and the, the commentator was saying that Michael Jordan is great at basketball because he does the basics really, really well. He just, he's got down the basics, the fundamentals, which causes him to be great at basketball. And I believe that can apply to our prayer lives as well. That if we master the basic art of praying, which is just communion with the Lord, a dialogue with the Lord, then we will be great at the Christian faith. We, it will make everything else that much better if we have a strong foundation in the basic principle of prayer. The first biblical character we're going to look at is Moses. Moses leads us off in this three-week series of prayer. And the first point of our first character we're looking at is that Moses himself was a product of prayer. The man Moses was a product of prayer. And we know this because Samuel, God's prophet Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8, this is Samuel's farewell speech. He's towards the end of his life. He's given a speech to the Israelites and he's reminding them of the good things the Lord has done for them. 1 Samuel 12, 8 says, After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help. And the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this place. They cried to the Lord. The, the Israelites prayed. Cried to the Lord is another term for prayer, for, for talking, for making a request to God. They cried to the Lord. They pleaded, please save us. And as an answer to that prayer, God sent Moses and Aaron to lead them out of Egypt. Without prayer... Without the prayer of the Israelites, Moses probably would not be the person that we know him as today and as, as scripture records him as, because he would not have come forth due to that prayer that had not been done. But the prayer was made, request was made to God, God answered, and then he brought forth Moses. Moses led the people out of Egypt. Which begs the question, is there someone in your life, in people's, in people's lives that you know of, that needs to come forth and step into a situation? If there is, we have a biblical template in prayer that says that if you make that request to God, he will send the right person when you pray for that person. Quick story, I was approached by a, a mother of some teens here um, in the church, and this mother asked if I would want to lead uh, a Bible study for a group of teenage boys. I was very honored to, to have that, that request made to me. You know, unfortunately, uh, due to many obligations, I wasn't able to, to lead that study. So her prayers led her to, to me. But even though I was not able to do it, my prayer now is that that right person be brought into their lives 
to help guide those those teenagers and 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 lead a Bible study to to teach those young men more about Jesus. Of course, I'm I'm in the youth ministry also here at Shoreline, so of course I let her know about the offerings that we have for youth. But in the interim, I am praying for the right person to step in and guide those young men. God will honor that prayer like he did in bringing Moses forth and the right person will come forth. Moses was a product of prayer. Point number two here is that we are different when we pray. We are different when we spend time with the Lord. So to illustrate this, we return back to Moses and his story of coming down from Mount Sinai. After spending 40 days and 40 nights alone with the Lord, he was fasting, he was praying. This is where God supernaturally etched the Ten Commandments into stone. Moses spent time alone with the Lord in prayer. He came back down from the mountain, and the Bible says that he was physically changed, that his his face was radiant because he had spent time with God. We read that in Exodus 34, 29. It says this, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. The Israelites saw Moses coming down. They saw their leader coming down from the mountain and they can see that he was physically changed. And it, it frightened them. They, they asked that he put on a veil over his face because he, he just reflected spending time with God. He reflected the, the, the effects of having quality time with the Lord. And likewise, I believe that when we spend quality time with the Lord, it becomes obvious. We become different when we pray. How are we different? We become different in our actions. The Bible refers to this as fruit. Jesus said, you will know people by their fruit. And if we spend time with God in prayer, in earnest prayer, we will become different People will see the physical effects. Maybe we're, we're, we're more happy. We smile more. We, we, we've got something different in the way we walk. We, we, we're upbeat. It, it shows physically because we spend time with the Lord. Another way that it will become clear that we are different because we spend time with the Lord is through our thoughts. Now, that's something that's totally different than the first example of actions because the thoughts, nobody knows but us. But I believe that when we spend time with God, when we earnestly meet him repetitively, we have no choice but to have the thoughts of God. It doesn't mean that the enemy won't try to get in there. He won't try to shoot his darts into our minds. But the Bible says we take every thought captive under Jesus. We take, we take those evil thoughts captive in the name of Jesus that, that the enemy will try, but He will not succeed to enter our thoughts if we are diligent in meeting with the Lord. How can we have evil thoughts if we're constantly meeting with God, if we're constantly meeting with the one who is holy and perfect? Another way that we become different when we pray is through our confidence. I believe this is a big one that we need today. There's a lot of influence in in the media. There's a lot of of messages that come across and tell us that we're not good enough. We need this and we need that to change, to, to, to meet the expectations of our culture today. But if we know we were made after the image of God, the one who is perfect, and we meet him through prayer, we will have a supernatural confidence. We'll have a confidence that we are made perfect in his eyes because of Jesus' sacrifice for us that we are perfect, that, that the things that come up in our, our day-to-day lives, the challenges, the pain, um, the yes, they will hurt, but we have a confidence that we will make it through it, that God's kingdom will see us through. And people, they'll be able to see that difference. They'll be able to see how we are different because we pray. Now, we're not to be like the Pharisees. Jesus warned us about being like the Pharisees who stand at the corners and and, and pray sh- shouting and sound out instruments and, and with big physical gestures, let everybody know how holy they are by praying. 
That's not the kind of prayer we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of prayer that is 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 in solitude. When Moses went up to that mountain uh, to pray with God for 40 days and 40 nights, he was alone. He received the physical benefits of, of being satiated with food and, and water um, through God supernaturally. God met those needs. Moses saw providence from God in private, meaningful prayer. No one, no one else was there on the mountain, just Moses and God, and that's all that was needed. God is more than enough for us. And E.M. Bounds says, about, says this about Moses, that Moses cannot do God's great work, even though it was God commissioned, without praying. Moses cannot govern God's people and carry out the divine plans without having his censer full of the incense of prayer. Okay, that was a lot. Let me, let me read it again. Moses could not do God's great work, even though it was God commissioned, without praying. Moses cannot govern God's people and carry out the divine plans without having his censer full of the incense of prayer. I'm going to explain more about what that is in a minute. But the third point is that we are powerless to carry out God's lofty plans without prayer. God had a lofty plan for Moses, right? He was to lead the Israelites, God's people, out of captivity from Egypt supernaturally lead them out. In, in no way could a man under his own strength do this. And Moses was given that strength through prayer. Moses constantly met with God. He was on the move. God's people, the Israelites, were on the move. They were traveling. And it says in the Bible that Moses set up a tent to meet with God this, this meaningful private prayer that we're talking about, that we're, we're, we're trying to do in our own lives, in our, in our own prayer life, is meet with God privately in prayer. Moses did this in the midst of leading God's people out of captivity. But without prayer, he would not be able to do that. God has a plan for us just like he had a plan for Moses. And that plan is is it's too hard to achieve without God's help through prayer. We need to pray for strength. We need to pray for his guidance through the Holy Spirit to help us achieve his plans for us in, in leading a family, in leading a company, in, in any task that you have where you need strength from the Lord. You can find that through prayer. The last line of that quote I read to you said, Moses could not govern God's people and carry out the divine plans without having his censer full of the incense of prayer. A censer is a, a Jewish instrument, kind of like a pan or a saucer that they would use, that Jewish priests would use in their their um, their duties in the temple, in 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 the um, the 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 tent of, of meeting where, where they would um, minister to the Lord and they would carry out their duties. A censer would be filled with incense. And as they burned that censer and the incense would, would loft uh, about in the, the tent or in the room, it just it filled it with a sweet smell, a sweet smell. It was, it was everywhere, everywhere where, where, where they, they burned that, that incense. And this is what I love about E.M. Bounds' writing. It's, it, it's so poetic. It says that Moses had a censer and it was filled with prayer. That incense that was, was lofting up was the prayers of Moses. And it constantly surrounded him wherever he went. Such beautiful writing telling us that we should also have our censers full of prayer. So, so that, that, that smell, the scent, how it comes and it, it, it just spreads around that that prayer, that the prayer that we have, it, it lifts and it spreads around and it covers us wherever we go. Another quote from the book, Obtaining Answers to Prayer, is this. Prayer affects God. He hears and answers prayer, and his conduct is influenced by prayer. God's conduct is influenced by our prayers, is point number four. Now, that's, that, that may sound kind of bold if, if you've never heard that before, that we can pray things, we can, we can ask requests to God, 
and his conduct will be affected by our prayers. That's what the Bible says. Now, that doesn't mean that we can boss God around. That doesn't mean that we, we demand him to do things as, as what is sometimes taught to Christians, that, that we can speak things into existence. You believe it enough, you pray hard enough, you can speak that into existence in your life. That is, that is wrong. God is the only one who can speak things into existence. We pray and we make requests to God. We ask him. We ask him earnestly um, through, through our, our righteous living. We, we can get an answer from God. We come to him with a, with a clean and pure heart. We can make our requests to him, but we don't speak things into existence. We, don't, we are not God. We don't create things out of nothing as God did. But when we make our prayers, God will answer. Uh, that The answer may not be what we want it, but God will answer our prayers. And Moses, through his request to the Lord during the, the 10 plagues that were sent out among the Egyptians, Moses, for four of them, was requested by Pharaoh to, to pray to God and put an end to these plagues. Pharaoh, a non-believer, asked Moses, who he knew had a dialogue with God, to pray, to pray and ask that God's conduct change what's happening on earth. And we read that in Exodus chapter 8, verses 10 through 11 says this, It will be as you say, now this is Moses talking to Pharaoh, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses your officials, and your people. They will remain only in the Nile, where frogs belong, in the river there. God's conduct then moved on earth and stopped the plague of the frogs at Moses' request. God's conduct is affected by our prayers. And what I love in that verse is that Moses tells Pharaoh that the frogs will leave you and your houses. Moses was confident because that was before he received an answer to the prayer, before the frogs had ceased. Moses told Pharaoh that they will leave him. I admire that confidence. That comes from somebody who has spent time with the Lord, who knows the Lord intimately and knows that he is good to answer the request. Point number five is that obtaining answers to prayer requires knowing God. We need to know God to get answers to our prayers. And Bounds makes this perfectly clear. He says that those who know God the best are the richest and most powerful in obtaining answers to prayer. Those who know him the best will, re will receive the answers to their prayers. So if I said I know somebody, if I know someone who's going through a really hard time in their life, not just everyday troubles, like I ran out of gas in my car, I got a flat, but something that, it, that just cuts deep, like a spouse walked out on them, or the death of a loved one, or a child who, who may be struggling with, with gender identities these days. It's, it's, it's all too common. These things are deep needs that, that need to be brought to the Lord in prayer for for help for comfort from the holy spirit and i said I, I know somebody who's going through one of these deep needs and the challenge here is that you need to find somebody to pray for that need to call up that person who's hurting and offer a prayer or to to meet them and pray you gotta you gotta come up with someone who's not you think about that person get them in your mind do you have that person so you probably don't have in mind somebody who you know does not spend time in prayer. You probably pick someone who has a deep connection with the Lord, who you are confident that they spend time in their Bible, they've applied the practice of prayer, they live what they preach, they are in communion with the Lord. They know the Lord and they can receive answers to their requests because they know God. I once was going through a really hard time 
in my life. I mean, I was down in the dumps. My life was on the projection to look totally different than it does today. All by my own mistakes, of course. And, and I was very fortunate to have access to somebody that I knew filled the qualifications that I just discussed. They spent time in the Bible. They had a frequent prayer life. They lived what they preached. And I knew who to go to in that time. So I met with that brother in Christ and he encouraged me. He read the Bible with me. He gave me wisdom. And that relationship, along with the Lord working in my life to change what needed to be changed, has led me to where I am now. Just an obvious recipient of God's grace, his provision, saw me through. But had I not sought out to, to get help from somebody who, who knew the Lord, things may have looked differently than they do today. And I'm, I'm very thankful to that person and thankful to God. Point number five is that obtaining answers to prayer requires knowing God. We need to know God. That brings us to our last point, is that we must be specific in our prayers. We must be specific in our prayers. E.M. Bounds shows us Moses' specificity in prayer by this. Moses' praying was specific, and God's answers likewise were specific. Almighty God always heard and always answered Moses when he prayed. Moses made specific requests to God. God, please stop the plague of the frogs. God, please help me as I lead these Israelites through, through these lands to the promised land. I need your help for this. God, I need you to join me for this. If you don't join me, I'm not going. I need you, God. His prayers were specific. Specific requests to God bring specific answers. We're not always going to get the answers we want. It'll be specific answers, but they may not be the specific answer that we want. Bring you back to Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel, as you probably know, the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, Daniel was a faithful servant of God. He had a repetitive prayer life. He met with God regularly in prayer. And because of this, people were jealous. They made a decree saying that anybody who prays to anybody but the current king will be thrown into the lion's den and meet certain death. Upon hearing that, Daniel knew he was in trouble because he prayed all the time to someone other than the king. He prayed to the God of Israel, the God that he knew intimately. He had a dilemma. He continued to do what he always did, though, and he prayed to God. Now, I want to ask you this. Do you think that Daniel's prayer was, please, God, I want to go to the lion's den so that your provision, that your strength can be shown so that I can be saved. That's what happened. But I don't think that's what Daniel's prayer was. If I was in that situation, if you were in that situation, I think our prayer would be, God, please prevent me from having to go to the lion's den. I don't want to end up down there with the lions. Do something, reverse that order. Save me from the lion's den. Think that I think that's what the prayer would be, but that is not what happened. We know that Daniel ended up in that lion's den. God still showed up. God's kingdom, it reigned at the end. God did not lose to trying to be uh, silenced by prayers being silenced to God. God ultimately wins. He will ultimately win in the end, but Daniel's prayer his prayer to avoid that situation um, was not answered in the way he wanted it to be answered. In, in my imagination, if you want to follow that thought with me. And Moses likewise had a request to God through prayer. It was a specific request. He wanted to see the promised land. In Deuteronomy 3.26, uh, this is the conversation uh, uh, that took place between God and Moses. And then Moses is filling in the Israelites as to what happened in that conversation when Moses requested to see the promised land. It says this, Moses is speaking, but because of you, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. That is enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me anymore about this matter. 
Look at the land with your own eyes, since you are not going to cross this Jordan, the Jordan River, into the promised land. God was pretty bold. He was pretty straightforward. He told Moses, no, you are not going to go into the promised land, but you can take a look at it over there. It reminds me of when I'm driving on the 101 up to uh, the Bay Area, and we I have, I have two young kids, a nine and a seven-year-old, and, and when we drive past Chuck E. Cheese there in San Jose, you can see the big mouse in the glass, and, and they always ask to go in. They always ask to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Dad, can we go there? When can we go there? You keep saying yes. Um, but it's it's like a tease. They 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 haven't seen they haven't seen the inside, but they can see the outside. And this was this was kind of like a tease. God told Moses, you can see the promised land. You're not going to lead your people there. I've chosen Joshua for that. And, and that was because of a sin that Moses did. We read earlier in his story that, that he was uh, disobedient to God. Uh, God told him to speak to the rock and have water come out of the rock. But then he took his staff and he smashed, or he hit that rock, water came out. God ultimately provided for the Israelites, provided water for them. But Moses was, was, not, dis, was not obedient to the Lord. And that was a sin and he had a consequence to pay for it. So though he made a specific request to God, it wasn't granted the way he wanted it to be granted. And sometimes that happens, but we need to trust God that he is sovereign. So to recap our points for today, I know there were a bunch, but let me recap them real quick. Number one is that Moses himself was a product of prayer. He was an answer to prayer. And similarly, if you've got a need, if you know of a need that needs a right person to step in, we can ask God and request through prayer that he send the right person. Our second point is that we are different when we pray, that it shows on our face, our confidence, our thoughts, our actions, things are different because we pray. Third point, Moses was powerless to carry out God's plans without prayer. And likewise, we are powerless to fulfill God's plans for our lives if we do not meet with him regularly in prayer. We need his strength. We need his Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to help us, to carry out his plans here on earth. We need to meet with him in prayer to get that help. God's conduct is also influenced by our prayers, that we can ask him and he is obligated through scripture to answer us. He will answer us. We don't demand God. We don't boss him around. He is not at our beck and call. We don't, we are not to be glorified. God is. We live to glorify him and we need to fall in our place. We ask him, his conduct is then affected by us, by our requests. We need to know God to get the answers to prayer. We need to know him. That knowing is, is much like the biblical definition of knowing. It's, it's an intimate knowledge. It's, 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 it's a deeper knowing than just an acquaintance. It, it is, it's a rich relationship with that person. We need to have a rich relationship with the Lord, constant communion, constant Bible readings to receive answers to prayer. Our last point is that we need to be specific in our prayers. Be specific in how you need his help. God, I need your help with finances. He's not going to gift you with money, but he will help you to steward the money that you've got. He will help you to be uh, better with, with finances or with your relationships. God, I need a specific answer to this prayer. In, in dealing with this person in my life, how can you help me through your spirit? And he will, he will show you. He will answer that prayer to improve relationships with people. No, we got to work on it. It's not, it's not a genie in the bottle thing. We're not just going to get it. We need to work on, on, on things ourselves. But through that teaming up with the Holy Spirit, God will answer those specific prayers. My challenge to you this week, between now and the next time we meet, is that we need to pick one of these, these points the ones I just mentioned, those six points, we need to pick one of them to add to our prayer lives, to add to our prayer time with the Lord. If we're not already doing them, we need to be specific. We need to speak and ask God to, to bring someone forward. We need to know God. All of those points I mentioned, we got to try to pick one, okay? Pick one from now until the next time we meet and apply it to your prayer life. I know you can do it. Add it in there and you will see God answering your prayers. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for this time. Thank you so much for, for the willingness of, of the, the people participating in this class. And as we go into discussions, God, would they be fruitful? Would our, our, our discussions and, and the things that we learn just affect us for a lifetime to come? And would it, would it also help those who come after us? Would we teach what we're learning here, what we've taken out from this book by E.M. Bounds, which ultimately was taken out from your word in the Bible, God, would we take that and teach it to others so that they can likewise grow in their prayer lives with you? God, be there like you promised in your word, like you said you are when we pray to you, that you listen and that, and that you are faithful to answer us, God. Thank you so much for being the great God that you are. We love you in your name, amen. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. with Buddy Soto. To join, please visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline Online page on our website and click join discussion. We're so excited to spend some time with all of you reflecting on the things that we have learned today. See you there.